Welcome back to Bird's Eye View. When it comes to the Orioles, this weekly podcast is your official source for a lack of insight and for basis opinion. Today is May 30th, 2024. This is episode 392. My name is Scott Magnus. And I'm Jake English. And on this week's show, we're going to play, well, someone's favorite song during 2131. One moment in time. I would like to point out that that was written and was not expected to be sung. Uh, we'll also and and I don't want to go for the high note. Is the best way to describe it. Like I'm just going to let that be. I think I think if we were going to end on a high note, yeah. we would have already done yeah. it. <laughs> about 200 episodes ago. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll also and I this don't, is all written down, right? <laughs> should we have been recording? Should we be recording? Uh, we're going to get opinionated about stuff that doesn't really matter, and we'll do that right after we lubricate the show. That's right. It's time for the drink of the week. Jake, what are you imbibing on this weekend? You're going to love it. You're going to love it. Scott, I was uh, I was in a bit of a funk this huh. week. I needed to do something to improve my mood. To purge. I went to the local uh, liquor store, mm-hmm. and I got me some comfort food. Okay. I'm drinking this evening a Bud Light Lime. Out of a slim can. Out of a slim... No. <laughs> no, I'm not. I poured it out of a slim can. You poured can. it out of a slim can into your uh, bat... Uh, Jar is the best way to bat it. mug. I don't know what this is. It it is it is a beer I'm drinking out of an Orioles bat. Well, enjoy uh, your hoppy water with natural flavoring in it. Uh, <laughs> I've got a Dewey Beer Company Flash of Diamonds Indian Pale Ale made with Galaxy and Citra hops. Um, nice little pale ale, kind of flirts with a hazy. I wouldn't call it quite a hazy, but it's kind of got a little bit of that. No, probably from the from the mosaic um, and the galaxy, but yeah, um, not a bad beer. Um, I've had better from Dewey, but it's a nice summer refreshing beer. Highly recommend giving giving Dewey a chance. No Bud Light Lime in that category. No, let's let's not go that far. Uh, if you want to know what we're drinking on a daily, weekly, or you know a mood basis for Jake, uh, check us out on Untapped. I'm at M E G N eight six zero six. I'm at Jake E four zero two five. And with that. Uh, I believe it is time for a checkup. I'm going to check your ears, check your eyes, find out how much you've grown. Time for your checkup. Going to listen to your heartbeat, fix you up, ready to go. Time for your checkup. <laughs> it's okay if you giggle. This will only kick a little. Time for your checkup. Time for your checkup. Well, when we last left you, you know, the medical wing was slowly improving and we were getting a little excited. And then that, that's on us. That's, that's on fault. us. That, that is a that is a problem. And then bad things started to happen. So let's go with maybe least bad to worst bad. That is how I wrote it. Down. Yeah, that's how well, you wrote it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, well, I think it's least bad to worst bad. Uh, so let's talk Jordan Westberg. Hit in the hand. Um, x-rays came back negative. It's pretty swollen. It's a good thing that they had the off day on Thursday. He didn't play on Wednesday. Um, but we we have seemed to avoid any Hammett issues, like a Nick Marcakis style. I'm also wearing my Nick Marcakis jersey as well today uh, in honor of that kind of uh, hand being preserved. We have we have avoided Nick Marcakis sadness. Yes. That was that was a deep sadness. Yeah. But yeah, um, it's, it's going to be interesting, you know, Hopefully he's back on Friday. Let's just say that much. Let's hope that he's back in the lineup on Friday. Um, but yeah, when you watch that happen, you're like, oh, please no. Oh, please no. Oh, please no. Now, as a positive, I mean, you know, the Orioles, if Westberg did have to go to the DL, I think the Orioles could, in essence, figure it out. And I I, I know they did it with Urias on Wednesday, but I don't know if that's the way they would run it out. Well, but, they could always bring up Joey Ortiz. Huh? But we we have to call it out of like Jordan Westberg has had an amazing season so far, both defensively and offensively um, to lose someone like Westberg with some of the lineup still scuffling. Um, it, it's going to be a big loss. So hopefully Jordan's able to bounce back, get back into the lineup Friday, if not this weekend. Um, and we, we can see to continue to see him contribute on that basis. Absolutely. Next, we've got Dean Kramer next worst, who is on the 15 day IL with a triceps injury. Uh, he is said to be improving, 
and could be cleared to play catch soon. Yeah, so I'm less worried about this. Um, you know, I think that they are being cautious with this. Um, we'll get to the next one, but unfortunately, it's just really bad timing for mm-hmm. Dean Kramer to hit the to hit the IL. Um, but again, I'm not I, I'm not super worried about this one. I'm looking at it and saying, hopefully, he's back by mid June ish is the best way to put it. I'm going to say that the next not worst is probably the still inactive uh, news of Tyler Wells. Yeah, I, I think that's probably accurate, which is um, he's been cleared to throw still in Sarasota, but really no details and plans. And it's kind of it seems like they're hoping they can make it work, but something bad might happen. No news in this case is not good news. Yeah. Do you think he's being dilentated here? Because they kept, they kept on being like, Dylan Tate, elbow inflammation, like, we're going to hold off, we're going to hold off, we're going to hold off. Like, it just kind of screams to me that, you know, they're going to let this linger as long as possible. And it's just, it's not going to happen. I just, I don't know what to think. Yeah. I, I don't know. I feel like, I feel like they could just come out and say, he's going to have to have surgery or we're going to shut him down for the season. Right. And uh, they could they could do that. They could come out and say, you know what? This is not going to improve in time for him to be able to pitch this season. We don't know what's up, but we're shutting him down. And and like that would suck. But I I feel like the story would go away in like five days. Yeah. Well, if you're not sure about that, then let's end on the most depressing note, which is John Means was removed after three scoreless innings after showing reduced velocity against the St. Louis Cardinals. He is currently not with the team and is getting a second opinion on his elbow. Yeah, that's that's all sorts of hard hurt. Yeah. I mean, John Means is just so easy to root for, and he was so good and and the only reason to watch an awful club, and no human being deserves as much as him to be able to play for a good club, to be able to be back from from a devastating arm injury it's just it's in a just world of sports fandom you would get to root on john means as he helps lead the club to a world series and again this is on us we in our last podcast we were talking about starting pitching and how impressive it has been lately and we talked about john means returning to the orioles rotation um, and we said, you know, definitely not a top three pitcher, but, you know, a four starter that we could see pitching in a playoff game number four. And that looks to be a faint memory at this point. Um, yeah. Whenever you have to go get a second opinion, not a good sign. Means uh, you didn't like the answer the first time. Yeah. Uh, so we shall see what John means. But Jake, we may have seen the last of John means as a Baltimore Oriole on the field. Yeah. I say, I say, yeah, because that, that statement makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I will say that you and I were very doom and gloom about him the first time he got injured. Yeah, you're right. You're right. But I, I think now it's even more doom and gloom of, you know, he is, you know, getting into that, you know, We'll call it, not call it mid thirty five or you know point, but I think he's going to be what thirty two next year. Yeah, doesn't he, look good. He could come back, but it, it doesn't look good. Is the best way to put it. Um, and the Orioles eventually have to figure out what does their core look like, and can they rely on a John Means being in the rotation? If it's any consolation, he's welcome to my elbow. That's good, no, but it's not really. Not, not really. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, uh, let's go uh, and and take a look at social media, unfortunately, especially uh, with recent events. Um, And let's go to this week on the social. So, Jake, why don't you start us off and let's start open threads. All right. Let's take a look at this thread uh, unraveling or whatever they call it. Uh, This is a a thread from Lenika underscore Eula, who says, you never know what you'll see at the Orioles game. A fan came dressed like Santa Claus with a picture. And I saw this fan on the broadcast. Uh And I simply have to ask, why? Why? I'm not mad about it. I'm not judging. I just want to know why. It's not not Christmas in July. Uh There's just, there's no discernible reason. Again, no hate. Just someone explain why. 
It's all right. Fan fan the way you want to fan is the best way to put it. Just hey, just you, don't start the wave. You do, you do you. <laughs> I'm just I just have questions. Yeah, this is all. Uh, continue on in threads. We're going to take the next one from the Athletic. MLB first approached Angel Hernandez about the possibility of retiring earlier this season. A source tells the Athletic the criticism had gotten louder. Hernandez was amenable to moving on, and now he's calling it a career effective immediately. Man, how bad do you have to suck? That there's basically a universal cry for you to stop doing it. And baseball's like, yeah, please, please go. How bad do you have to be for Joe West to come and say, hey, he's not that bad? Uh, This is good for baseball, right? I I think it's fine. I think it's good that, you know, we are, we'll call it trimming some of the population out of the the umpiring ranks that um, make it awkward. Um but yeah, um, like in an era where it's very easy to say, and it's very easy to say that there's no accountability for umpires. I mean, it kind of feels good to to see someone pushed away. They paid him money to walk away. Yeah. Rather than to screw up more baseball games. Jake, when you were a child, if your coaches in baseball could have paid you money to go away, I, they would have been a lot better. Yeah. yeah. Teams would have been a lot better and I, I would have had a lot more lunch money. Yeah, exactly. For other people to take away. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think it's it's it is what it is. But um I, I want to head over to Blue Sky. Yeah, sure. And that's still existing, right? Uh, apparently so. Yeah. This is a uh, post from Charm City Slicker at Sprawl Hater. Um and the the post Sprawl. Sprawl. Like, <laughs> I think it's like like Sprawl. <laughs> Not quite. We're back. <laughs> so, <laughs> the post is as follows. <laughs> the city council should vote to kick Keegan Aiken off the Orioles. I can't take this fool any longer. And like, obviously, that is an absurd thing to say. But I just, I just want to follow the thought experiment down to its logical conclusion. I want you to imagine for a second that there is a democratically elected body that gets to decide things like the roster for the Orioles. And one... What absolute chaos that would be. But secondly, what absolute chaos the election advertising would be. Like, think about in this silly season right now, how many phone calls and emails and texts you're getting. Like, imagine well, that, let's... but the messaging being like, do you want Keegan Aiken answering the phone at 3 a.m.? Well, go back a year ago when you had fans in essence saying, the city of Baltimore needs to claim eminent domain. <laughs> over the Orioles in order to maintain them in the city of Baltimore. Because again, that worked really well with the Colts when they were threatening that to the Colts organization. Really well. Great philosophy. Um, Look, this person is not being serious, but like I have given this more thought. I, I have given this more thought than than I should have. You you absolutely have. And it just it just gives me the giggles. Yeah. Uh last one. Uh, a little less the giggles, by the a way. A lot less the giggle standpoint. So this one comes from Jake Mintz. Uh, you can follow him at Jake Mintz, obviously co-host of Suspita's Family Barbecue. Um, Jorge Lopez's tantrum warranted criticism and maybe even his getting cut, but his post-game response, clearly jumbled by the language bearer, deserves empathy and context on a sad and unfortunate moment for a human being with a lot on his shoulders. Look, you know, there's a lot that can be said about this, but there's one thing that we have saw multiple times with Jorge Lopez as a Baltimore Oriole, great guy, a guy that has willing to take accountability for his actions, you know, um, obviously a lot going on with the family, with his, with his kid. Um, and it was just really interesting once again, to see the New York media and us jump all over an individual and basically say, we have a story here to write. We're going to, in essence, take someone to the woodshed, uh, without giving any context or asking questions and just, you know, saying, well, this is what he said. And it's just like, but did he actually mean that? Did he actually think about that? Um, does he understand on that aspect since English is a second language? There's just a ton of aspects. So highly recommend, you know, it's going to be in, in, in our blog post. Um, take a look at this thread that Jake Mintz has as, long, as well as this article. Um, yeah, I mean, Jorge did not have a good evening is the best way to put it. But again, there is so much going on in the world and with individuals that it's very tough for me to look at someone like Jorge Lopez and immediately judge him for all the good things that he's ever done in his career. I think about that scene from Ted Lasso, right? Is it excusable? 
Absolutely not. Absolutely not. But for him to do what he did, I choose to give him love. Mm-hmm. I think I think Jake is right. This is a moment that deserves empathy. So Jorge Lopez, Bald Memorial? No. No? No. Do I think it will happen? No. Okay. Do you want it to happen? I mean, can he help the team? That's my question to you. I mean, it can't be worse than some of these guys. Is he worse than Thiago Vieira? I hope not. Hello, I am Thiago Vieira. I was waiting for that. <laughs> I think we've done all the damage on the <laughs> socials that we can do in this moment. Is there something is there something else on the show we usually do? I don't think so at this point. I mean, we've only done this like 390 times. Let's close it down. Uh, let's close it down. Let's go around the bases and figure out uh, what has occurred since we last talked on this fine broadcast. Scott, you know, I love this music, this fine music provided for us each week by my buddy Josh Finver, of course. National fan galore, but Black Dog Prowl. It's a great great song. Um, But I think this music is inappropriate for the topic we're about to address. And so I was wondering if you could find us something a little more appropriate. So you want to stroll to first base? Yeah. All right, let's, let's go ahead and stroll to first base. Scotty? Yeah. It's a sad day. On an equally sad podcast. The death of the streak is a blast. Oh. 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 Scott, for the first time in, well, since we played the Rangers, the Orioles have been swept in a baseball series in excess of two, two games? games? Yeah. Oh! And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't know how I got up and faced the world that next day. <laughs> the most crucial thing that the Orioles could have done was to not get swept, and they've now, well, they've now done it. They ended it. It's over. All right, let's let's talk about this. So, <laughs> the Orioles got swept, and I have to be honest with you, I'm fine with. It. I'm 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 glad because I, I was tired of this storyline, and I, and I find it to be a distraction. All right, so I I hear this, I, I get it, and you, we've talked about this in the past with streaks, and I've talked about it as it relates to like the five run given up by pitchers and how long that would go for when the Orioles were really bad, and I get it. Uh, the streak was it, it is a silly thing. Is the best way to put it. It's it's a silly thing. Let's not go there. Just like Camelot. Um, but but in reality, like if you look at the whole scenario, I mean, it started with Adley coming up, and it lasted for two years. And during that time, the Orioles had been one of the top five teams in Major League Baseball from a winning percentage standpoint. That's the story, right? that's the big deal, which is, yes, the number for the streak is is cool, but in reality, the story is, since Adley Rutschman came up, the winning percentage has been, yeah, what was it, 550, 560, it's something weird like that. Um, the Orioles have been one of the best teams in Major League Baseball. That's the story that we need to be talking about. And And the other thing that goes along with that is that if you look at what the Orioles are doing, all they're doing is winning. Mm-hmm. I mean, right now, they've had a, a reasonably rough stretch of games over the past couple of weeks by comparison. Sure. And the Orioles have a 648 winning percentage, mm-hmm. which, you know, they're not going to keep up all season. That's not the way this works. I'm you not, sure about that? <laughs> you sure about that? <laughs> if you they, sure about that? If they keep it up, <laughs> it's a 104 win uh, pace. Yeah. Things are fine. You look at the Orioles World Series. Uh, Why does it not feel fine then to people? Because that's what what is the really weird thing is like people are s- looks at this and say, "I don't like the way it feels." 
It's weird. I think it's I think it's because we as a fan base have trauma. I really That's do. Fair. And and honestly, like once the monkeys off the bat at our backs and the Orioles win a World Series, we're gonna be Red Sox fans at that point. God, I hope not. Maybe we might be. Please no. We might be pink hatters. Jesus Almighty. But once that happens, that following season, if they are very very good mm. or very pretty good, and they lose five games in a row. I don't think we're going to freak out. Yeah, I, I think you're right that there's still a scar, and it's the standpoint of, um, is the shoe going to drop? Yeah. Is the way to describe it. Are you going to go back into bad tendencies and bad habits? Um, and are you, in essence, going to revert? But the thing is, like, you look at the talent and you look at how the team plays, and again, this is the whole comes back to, to your thing. They play like a completely different team and then the 2021 Jorge Lopez Orioles is the best way to describe it. So I, I think the streak is a really big deal uh, the, in terms of looking at it and saying, what do we say all the time? Go win series. Mm-hmm. Don't get swept is the best way to put it. Um, and I think that's where it comes back down to. It's all about winning percentage. And you know, I think, yes, they lost to a Cardinals team, which is not a very good team. But honestly, that's baseball. And that's going to happen over the course of a long season. And based off that sweepless streak and based off of all the great teams that we have seen through the past century, it just goes to show you it happens. It's not a big deal. And there are really good teams out there that will get swept once, twice, three times, and even have prolonged losing streaks. of Like four. the 83 Orioles. Right. Six game losing streak, I believe it was. It was seven, yeah. Yeah. I think it's two Matt, seven games. Matt Taylor, correct us on that in the future. Um, but again, it's going to happen. It sucks. Like I was really upset that you know they got swept, and you should be upset as an Orioles fan. But it was great to see them come back out the next game um, against the White Sox and say we're going to reestablish ourselves. And you know they they mopped it is yeah. the best way to describe it. So good for them. But yeah, um, farewell to the streak. Um, you know it was nice while it lasted, but I really enjoyed the guys basically saying we're going to start it again. And we're just going to go out there and keep winning. Um, so that's exactly what I wanted to see. Here, here. Yeah. Speaking of how they go about the winning, let's go on to second base. And in second base, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say it. We are seeing Gunnar Henderson put his campaign together for an MVP season. Yeah. I remember at the very beginning of the season, I said, from an offensive standpoint, I think Gunnar has the possibility to be Mookie Betts. And, you know, sure enough, you know, if you look at Mookie's numbers in terms of weighted runs created plus, um, Mookie's at 176 weighted runs created plus, which is best in the National League right now um, from an from an F4 standpoint. Um, and Gunner is right there behind him at 164. Um, you know, from an F4 standpoint, Gunner currently is third um, from a war standpoint. But if you look at baseball reference uh, war, I think Gunner's number one at this given moment. So. Gunner is posting some outlandish numbers. Let's look at these season stats. 258 average, 354 on base percentage, 584 slugging, uh, good for a WOBA of 399 or a weight earnings credit plus of 164. You know, you, you look at someone like um, a Juan Soto, he's at 425 and 182. You look at an Aaron Judge, 430, 185, who, again, Aaron Judge has been absolutely walloping the ball in May. So, um, Gunner has shown a consistency through the season. Um, and again, it's very interesting to see that power surge um, this year um, where he is forecast at this moment to hit over 50 home runs this season. That's impressive to me for an individual that, you know, has the base running acumen um, and, and, you know, the defensive prowess that he does. Um, Gunner is cementing himself easily as a top five player right now in Major League Baseball. Yeah. The other thing that's crazy about Gunner right now is not only are the numbers piling up, but we also get to watch him play baseball. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but like, remember how it felt to be able to watch Manny Machado play third base every day. Like, every day you went, wow, it is a privilege to watch that baseball player do these things. And I feel like Gunner is in that same territory. Defensively, on the base pads, in the batter's box. You look at him every night and you go, holy crap, he's really good at baseball. 
that's something I've never seen before. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I said, I when you look at Gunner, you just see the talent level in comparison to other players. But you know, the one thing, I mean, there there keeps coming back to this question of like, you know, Gunner or Manny, who who is the better player? And again, I'm not going to get into that game. But what's really interesting to me, you know, comparing to that is it's really interesting to see Gunner now playing with all the guys he came up with, the Jordan Westbergs, the Colton Cows, or the Kyle Stowers, even Adley to a certain regard on that basis too. Um, and, you know, from a Manny standpoint, Manny didn't have that. Like Manny came in, came up through the organization pretty quickly, but didn't have a group of friends except for Scope um, on that basis. So it's really great to see Gunner thriving, but also see Gunner getting it from the boys is the best way to describe it um, in terms of, you know, keeping it, you know, fresh um, and not getting in his head. And, and sometimes I wonder if, if that was a Manny situation where it's like Manny was a man on his own island mm. and, you know, sometimes got into his head as well. But Gunner is just so he's aggressive. He, you know, throws his bat around when he's walking and stuff like that. But man, it's so fun to watch him play um, with his friends um, and just seeing what he does every single night. And it's hysterical to, to listen to Hyde talk, you know, continue to defend his his position of, you know, leading off with Gunnar Henderson. He's like, I want to see him hit as often as possible. It's not he, a it's not a bad call. I no. mean, I mean, I mean, in, in my ideal world, I would probably actually put Gunnar in the number two slot. But again, it's quibbling over a minor thing, in my opinion. So um, I've got no issues with Gunnar being in the leadoff spot because I agree with with Hyde. I want to see him as many times as possible. And yes, solo home runs happen at the very beginning of the game. But just like we saw with the Red Sox um, game where he hits a grand slam, y- you want that individual to come up as soon as possible. Um, and they're going to get opportunities like that in some instances. They won't get in the top of the verse, but they might get in the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth inning. So um, yeah, here's to Gunnar Henderson, an amazing season so far. Um, let me let me throw this back at you. you. We talk about how good Gunner is at everything and everything. What is one area that you feel like you are looking for Gunner to improve on going forward? And again, you have to think about it. I mean, Alex Cora said even like he's going to be really annoying to play against the American League case, but he's 22 years old. He's going to be 23 in a month. Super young still. And and, and Brandon Hyde talks about this one thing. He's still learning the game. He's still, in essence, developing as a player. What is one thing that you've seen that you're like, I would hope that he can continue to improve on this? Yeah, I'm not trying to be a coward, but I don't know what that thing might be. You know, when you look at Adley, and I I mean, I love Adley, Yeah, right? I love Adley. But one of the things I've said is, I would love to see him throw out more more base sure. runners. And, you know, maybe that's some of his, his pitchers not doing him any favors and yada, 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 yada. But when I look at Gunnar Henderson, nothing, and I mean nothing, jumps out and says, uh, I, I think he plays a mean shortstop. Mm-hmm. And when I say that, I mean the range is there. Yep. The arm strength is there. Yep. The decision making is there. The athleticism is there. You know, he gets the balls in the outfield. He gets the balls in the infield. It's it's. I have a hard time saying, oh, that's a weak spot. You look at the way he runs. He's a fantastic base runner yep. when it comes to turning on the Jets to make doubles into triples. Yep. He hits for power. He has good on-base skills because, again, he's getting walked. He's starting to hit left-handers now. Yeah. I, I Honestly, right now, he is playing at such a level that it's hard to poke a hole in that game and say, well, I want to quibble this. I, I agree. It's very difficult. I think the only thing I would say, and I think it continues to get better and better each game, is at the very beginning of the season, you could see him playing shortstop, and he was playing shortstop at a great level. Timing was sometimes just a, a hair off in terms of it. Sometimes he had to rush a throw mm. or anything like that. But I've seen him get better and better as the season progresses in terms of being able to, you know, charge a ball or let the ball come to him and in essence do it. So he's starting to get that timing down at shortstop that is going to turn him into, you know, a gold glover um, and again, this MVP candidate. Again, as good as he is at offense, his defense is what's going to make him an MVP candidate. I, I think maybe I have thought of something. Okay. It's the facial hair. Yeah, the the mustache. Um, you know, Baltimore went Gaga over the Fu Manchu. Yeah, 
I'm just not sure we were ready for the Wyatt Earp mm-hmm. or whatever that is that he's got. Um, look, I'm not anti stash. I just think he's got to find the right balance. He's got to find the right look for him. Yeah. All right. I don't think we're there. Maybe Van Dyke, you know, get some of that uh, chin, chin working. Look, Gunner, you're playing at an MVP level. This is the bigs. You need MVP facial hair. All right, let's go to third base and let's talk about what everybody is concerned about, which is the June gauntlet. And uh, and when you say everybody's concerned about it, you mean no one. Honestly, there is more people concerned about this June gauntlet than I was expecting. And again, people are looking at the schedule and looking at the days off and who they're going against up through the All-Star break. And people are losing their minds to a certain regard. They're like, I don't know how the Orioles are going to get through this. And I, I come back and I think, like, didn't we just do this in September of last year? Like, and that was much higher stress level um, because you're basically going back and forth with the Rays at that time. So it's a double edged sword. Yeah. You, you mentioned the off days. Yeah. I, I will say that this past month, I feel like too many Mondays, too many Thursdays. I'm milling about the house. I'm like, man, I wish there was a ball game on tonight. There is one day in June, Mm -hmm. one day where we will not have Orioles baseball. Yeah. Now, hopefully they won't be running ragged and exhausted and it's a negative thing, but more baseball is always better. Yeah. No, I mean, I I get it. And again, you're not in a great position right now from the pitching standpoint. We were talking about the last episode of like, you've got a ton of pitchers to play with. um, And now you don't have it as much with means and Kramer being out. Um, but But I look at this and I look at the roster as per se and again you're playing a lot of AL East teams you're playing the Jays you're playing the Rays you know over almost a week and a half is what's good but let's be candid like the Jays and the Rays are not playing like good teams right now yeah and I understand it's division yeah and anything can happen just like we saw last year with like the Red Sox and stuff like that but they're not good teams so like yes you have to go out there and play them their baseball teams and their major league baseball and they're in the division but at the same point, like, they're not going to be like the Yankees. They're not going to be like the Phillies. They're not going to be like the Dodgers. So I look at that and say, yeah, those will be tough series, and it's never fun to go to Tampa. But, you know, heavy who wears the crown is what we describe it. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Like, a part of me looks at it and says, at least you're on the East Coast. You're not having to change time zones or anything like that. I think... The guys are going to figure it out is the best way to put it. All right. So you're not worried about the Jays. You're not worried about the, I mean, overly worried, overly worried. The Orioles have to play the Braves. Now, of course, God, the Braves having to deal with that terrible injury. I mean, that's just, that's just unbelievable. That's terrible for baseball. Really? I mean, there's nobody that's not upset about that. No, that's just, yeah, it's really just a terrible situation. But again, you look at that and you look at how the Braves are playing right now with Acuna out of the lineup. I mean, they're, I think are going to lose again to the nationals potentially as well. Um, the Braves, I mean, the Braves are still a really good team. Let's, let's, let's just mm-hmm, call it out mm-hmm. that, but they scare me less this year than they do last year because of, you know, folks being injured. Um, so you take advantage of that is, is the best way to put it. Now, one of the other NLEs teams that they're going to play is the Phillies the at Philly, home, the Phillies during and, a weekend and Yankees back to back is brutal, but that Phillies series at home in Baltimore that's going to be a loud freaking series. I guarantee you there's going to be a ton of Phillies fans coming down for that series. Guarantee it. So I can promise you this. Jake English is going to be on this podcast uh, roughly the week of Ju- June 17th, so after the Phillies, and he's going to say, Baltimore, I told you about attendance. Where were you? How'd you let all these Phillies fans get to the stadium? I'll be there on Saturday the 15th. That's great. I am eager to get the in-person aspect of how many Phillies fans there are uh, and how um, how upset you are about it. But that's going to be... Nah, good for them. It's going to be an amazing series. Yeah, I agree. It's going to be an amazing series. Um, I mean, it's going to be a really fun one. But again, I, I think, you know, you have to be circling the Yankee series going up to New York, 18th, 19th, and 20th. Huge. It's going to be a huge series. And we talk about this all the time. You know, you look at that, not just in terms of placement in the division, but that tiebreaker scenario, I think we're going to see, just like we have in previous series, the Orioles are going to put everything in their power to set themselves up. So 
They'll be manipulating their roster. They'll manipulating their starting pitchers, just like they did for the last Yankee series. That is going to be like a playoff series once again. We do get a little bit of a break in the fact that, I mean, we have the Guardians there and they're playing great baseball. Guardians are, have the best record in Major League Baseball right now, right? But outside of that, around that series, yeah. we get the Astros who are scuffling and the world champion yep. Texas Rangers who are also, also scuffling. On, the, on the struggle bus. Again, I think at the very beginning of the season, you looked at this this roster, the schedule, and you're like, oh my gosh, that is a, that's a, that's a terrible June. But now that you look at it and you're like, all right, that's still going to be a really tough June, especially with the days off. But there's some wiggle room in there now, I think. The other thing is, remember, these good clubs, they're not looking forward to playing the Orioles either. No, exactly. So, again, um, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to win every series. You might even get swept one of those series. Hopefully it's not the, Yan- Hopefully it's not the Yankee series. That's the only thing I'll say. How dare you? But... You know, if the Orioles go out there and manage to win 600 baseball, which is a little bit less than what they're currently playing, guess what? That's okay. That's all right. It's going to be fine. Um, But also, I will point out, too, all these people that are saying, well, the Orioles have a great record against winning clubs. It's a great opportunity to win against teams like the Astros and the Rangers um, and the Rays and the Jays who are playing at 500 or slightly below 500. Here, here. All right, let's uh, let's head into home plate, and Scotty, I want to do just a quick thumbs up, thumbs down. Okay, how you feeling? Gauge your temperature, type of deal. Sure. Let's start with the new anthropomorphic hot dog races at Camden Yards. I am a big thumbs up for this one. Big thumbs up. Big thumbs up for this one. Why? First of all, it's fun. Like it's fun. It's great. I mean. It's it's something that the kids are going to love is the best way to describe it. I mean, you see how people get so excited for the video board um, with the hot dogs. This is great. This is good, good classic, good classic fun. Yeah, no, no issues with this whatsoever. I am not a gig, like gigantic uh, hot dog race fan, and I have to agree with you. Good, good, clean fun. Good, clean fun. Thumbs all the way. All good. Yeah, all good. All right. Thumbs up. Thumbs down. Craig Kimbrell's performance since last we were prepared to tar and feather him. Can I go sideways? Uh, sure. Sure. I'm going to go 45 degrees up. 45 degrees up. I mean, yeah, 45 degrees up. I'm I'm giving it a thumbs up. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not against it. There isn't anything there, but I, I want to see him in a really stressful situation. I don't trust him. Yeah, exactly. But it's looked better. It, it's looked better from a, from a stuff standpoint, mm-hmm. but I just, I don't know. Like, that's why I don't want to really fully commit to it. Fool me once, shame on... Well, you're not going to fool me again. Right. Uh, Thumbs up, thumbs down. Uh, Keegan Aiken's regression to the mean. Uh, I'm going to go thumbs down on this one. Meaning you don't like it or you don't think it's happening? Uh, I don't like it, but I think it's happening. Hey, don't cry because it's over. Smile because it happened. Yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, Keegan Aiken has been one of the best relievers for the Baltimore Orioles so far this season. I just, I think it's, it. if you look at the stuff, though, it just doesn't scream like, wow, to me, is the best way to put it. So I'm going to give it a thumbs down. All right. Thumbs up, thumbs down. This Orioles roster's ability to withstand the pitching injuries. This is a major thumbs down for me right now. So thumbs down. So you don't think that the Orioles will be able to withstand these injuries? No, I don't think so. I mean, you you take a look at, you know, what's happening right now with Cole Irvin um, going back into the rotation, Suarez going back into the rotation, and people are like, man, I really wish we had kept Mike Ballman. Um, And it's not a situation where we should be thinking about, oh, I wish we still had Mike Ballman on this roster. So... I look at this, and we've talked about it all season, even coming in before the season. I look at the situation with pitching and looking at the injuries that we have, you know, now, you know, taken on with John Means and Tyler Wells and Keegan Aiken, and and you know, not to you know, knock on wood too much, but again, you're still playing with Kyle Bradish, you know, with a slightly torn UCL and hoping that nothing wrong happens. Um, so I, I look at it and I say. From a roster's ability to withstand injuries, the Orioles have to go out and figure out what they're going to do to invest on this basis going forward. 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's do thumbs up, thumbs down. The usefulness of Ramon Urias as a utility guy. This is a thumbs down for me. I don't see the Ramon Urias like hype train. I'm glad that he's had some really productive hits. I'm glad he had a home run last evening. Um, but Ramon Urias is not my utility guy. I mean, how? I mean, he can play second base. He can play third base. Really can't play shortstop. Can't play first base. So, like, is he really truly like a super utility guy? I mean, they're going to try to try to make it happen, but I don't think he is, right? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we'll see. I, I think he's the guy we've got. Okay, fair enough. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Jorge Mateo as a semi-regular. Uh, this is two thumbs up for me. Okay, <laughs> tell me more. I've been super impressed lately by Jorge Mateo. Um, I mean, I, he's been playing amazing defense at second base. Um, he's been doing a really nice job on the base pass. Um, but again, you just look at him at the plate, um, and he's just doing a, an amazing job at the plate um, with some plate discipline, spraying the ball, even popping for power. So again, we kept making fun of April Mateo. We are now through May. Jorge Mateo has a 108 weighted runs created plus. If you'd have told me that Jorge Mateo can give me the defense that he does, the base running, and he can post 108 weighted weight runs created plus, sign me up. And again, Jorge Mateo is playing so good right now that there isn't even a conversation about Jackson Holiday right now. So Jorge Mateo deserves a thumbs up. In my opinion, he deserves two thumbs up. All right. Hip, hip, Jorge. <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. Kyle Stowers. Over Hessen Kerstad. I'm okay with this, actually. Uh, and the whole reason is because Stowers is a righty and Kerstad's a lefty. No, they're both lefties. Are they both lefties? They're both lefties. Well, I still like Stowers over Kerstad as it is. Look, he's performing. I, I, think, I think he's being given more opportunity because he can play the field at a higher level. Can he? Yeah. I don't know about that. They seem to trust him in the outfield. They seem to trust him more. Way more than Kirsten. So when you watch Stowers play the right field and he tried to make some of those plays on the foul line, there wasn't much speed there, right? Mm. I mean, it kind of looked like Anthony Santander. I think part of it is a lack of familiarity out there. He looks slow to me. Okay. He looks bulky and slow. We'll, we'll have to... I'll have to watch it. Uh, I wouldn't say bad. I wouldn't say bad. All right. But I would say like... If Santander and Stowers are both out there, I would almost wonder if Santander has better range than Stowers. Hmm. I will have to watch it critically. What it what I will say is, for better or for worse, the Orioles are way more comfortable throwing Stowers out there defensively, and because of that, he gets more at bats. And Stowers has made the most of them. Let me ask you this question. Hmm. Um, are, are you of the opinion, I'm, I'm gauging you on this one. Let me see if I'm reading you correctly. You don't see much of a difference between Stowers or Kerstad in your mind. Like, you feel like they're somewhat interchangeable at this moment. No, I mean, I think I think Kerstad should be way more of an offensive weapon. Okay, so you think Kerstad is actually potentially more of an offensive weapon and potentially a better player than Stowers. Yeah. Do you think they're playing Stowers in order to market him out to potentially bundle him for our trade purposes? No, I think they're trying to win baseball games. Okay. That's fine. I just was curious. And and isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? My initial, like, just off-the-cuff response is... Your gut says the team they're is, trying to win baseball. The team is doing the things that it takes in their mind to win baseball games. That's a, that's weird. That's weird. That's weird. It's weird. Uh, thumbs up, thumbs down. Mm -hmm. It's been a lot of conversation about the center field and the future of the outfield. Uh, especially as Cedric Mullins not only struggles, but, you know, we know that he won't be around for forever, forever. He's not ancient, but he's he's not one of the young guys. And, uh, you know, there's been a lot of conversation about, oh, well, is, is Kowser really a center fielder? And the conversation keeps coming back to Enrique Bradfield Jr. Mm -hmm. Is he, you know, again, first round draft pick? Is he the kind of guy that we should be expectantly waiting for? Or is he just happens to be in the system? I think people should be excited about Enrique Bradfield. You have 80 speed, you have 80 defense, but we also have to print perspective. He's at Aberdeen right now. So he's at high A. So at the very earliest, I think you're seeing him maybe in 2026. Are you saying that everybody doesn't fly through the system? 
I certainly don't think with Enrique Bradfield's bat that he's going to fly through the system. But look, I think Enrique Bradfield is going to be a great player. I think he's going to be a major league baseball player. There's no doubt about it. But I think you have to look at someone like Hauser and look at the power that he's putting out there and the defensive range that he's putting out there to a certain regard and be like, you know, for 2024 and 2025, that's a guy that we need to be playing as much as possible and seeing what he can develop into. And then maybe in 2026, you look and say, is Kowser my guy or do I want to switch back to Enrique Bradfield and move Kowser back to a corner outfield position? But I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, you look at how Kowser plays. And again, Kowser has not been great over the past few weeks offensively, but from a pop standpoint, and that's what, what I, why I like Kowser, I much prefer Kowser right now in center field than I do Mullins, even with Mullins' defensive you know, benefits as well. So the discussion leading back to uh, EJB, you, you were thumbs up on that. I'm thumbs up on Enrique Bradfield, but I, if I was, um, if I was, you know, the verge, I'd be all about Enrique Bradfield and I'd love Enrique Bradfield, but he is so far away. I mean, just think 2026, 2026 just seems so far away to me at this point that it's hard for me even to fathom. So, I need to focus on this year. I need to focus on next year before I focus on Enrique Bradfield in 2026. Okay. Well, Scott, we have gone around the bases. Mm -hmm. And as we usually do, this would be a time for us to switch over to the next segment. But let's break the rules. Break the rules? We've gone around the bases. Let's uh, let's take one more stop. Let's let's go back to the dugout, if you will. I want to talk about... uh, I'm going to hold out my hand like Buck Showalter, and you're just going to go right past me. Fly right by. (laughs) I want to ask you about the ballpark fan survey that yeah. the Orioles sent out specifically about the future of Camden yeah. Yards. The next chapter. <laughs> the next chapter. Uh, I mean, I want to I want to talk about each of each of the things. Sure. Um, but uh, it, it came down to a few, you know, gauging interest from the fans on a f- on a few things. So here's one. Uh, and I'm going to lean heavily on an article from the Baltimore Banner. Sure. Not as a as a, a, a quick aspect, I filled out this survey today. Oh, you did? So I filled out the survey, so I'm very familiar with this survey. So, All right, first first option. Yes. The family zone. Yeah. Um, so this was an option that was given, basically, say we wanted to potentially expand out the family zone, what would you like to see in the family zone, um, everything like that. So first of all, um, we are both getting to an age where the playgrounds are, in essence, you know, becoming a foreign aspect to us. <laughs> um, however, what I will say is, as two individuals that have raised kids, having a family zone at Cannon Yards is an absolute necessity. Uh, it, 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 and, and, and the other aspect, too, is what was covered was when you were over at the current fan zone, uh, right there in right field by the foul pole, you have no clue what's going on with the game. Like you're listening to cheers. There's one TV and it's like a little, you know, 50 inch. Um, you have no idea what's going on. Like nothing. You could be so far away from the game. It's not like you're even at the game. So they've got to figure out a better way where kids can in essence be playing uh, while the parents can in essence be there and be seeing into the, into the stadium. We get a lot of, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, from, from listeners who will send us, you know, messages and say, Hey, uh, any advice for uh, parents of, of small children, you know, taking them to the ballpark? And our answer is always something along the lines of be prepared to be there for three innings. Yep. Buy as much candy, co- cotton candy and popcorn as you can. Be prepared to stroll around the park more than you are uh, watching the game because you want the kids to have a good enough time that you can continue to come back and you don't want it to be a chore and you don't want it to be an experience they hate. This, this family zone, this gets kids not only in the ballpark, but associating Orioles baseball with a great time. I'm also going to go a sidetrack off of that. What you just said is what all of this is. And it's not just for kids, but it's for the entire community. So if you're listening to this podcast, um, you have, Sorry. you have a problem, is the best way to describe it. You are like us, where you like to go to the game, you watch a ton of baseball games on, on the TV, listen to the radio, you're listening to a baseball podcast. You have a, a disease, you have an addiction, um, you need to seek help. However, there are people that go to the baseball games um, specifically for the sights, the sounds, the ambiance, the food, um, and, and really, you know, 
they want to tell our neighbors that they want it, but they're not living or breathing and dying on, on this basis. And what I found reading through all of these as I kept coming back and thinking to myself, this is a way to, in essence, make it more of a community space rather than just a baseball stadium. All right. I have thoughts on that. I know. We're going to come back to that. I'm going to wait. You're going to wait. I'm going to wait. Wait in the dugout, okay? You can throw out your bubble gum and the Gatorade cooler at a later point, but let's keep going through this. Next uh, option on the survey is an in-stadium museum. Okay. So um, I saw this. Um, I love museums, but in my opinion, this is something that is a hard pass for me. Really? Because I think this is a no-brainer the other way. Yeah, this is a hard pass for me. I I think there's there's so many things that you could do. Like, for example, right outside of the stadium at Camden Commons, you've mm-hmm. got that mm-hmm. one building. That yeah. could be your that could be your museum. Um, you've got the Babe Ruth Stadium right down the road. You could partner with them if necessary. There's so many other things to do. I would not be would not be utilizing space in the stadium or in the warehouses at this moment for an in-stadium museum. One of the things I liked about whatever they call it now that used to be Dempsey's is that you could go in, you know, on non-game days mm-hmm. and and have a meal and a, and a beverage at a cheaper price, mind, mind yeah. you, uh, and be able to peer into the ballpark. Mm-hmm. And I think it's cool to think that, one, you could take advantage of a museum uh, while you're there, right? Yep. You're there, you bring your kid, and you're like, hey, let's go look at, at uh, the Ghosts of Orioles Pass. But maybe it's the type of deal where you could go in on a non-game day and sure. have a... Yeah, I mean, they've got something similar at Del Marva. So if you go to the yeah. Del Marva starting room, they have a museum there. Um, I, I get it. It's not the thing I would focus on at this moment for the stadium. Okay. Option number three. Yep. Crab Shack. Yeah. Uh, not a fan. Once again, yeah. I I'm, mean, I'm with you. I'm fine with it at minor league baseball games. It's not, not what I want to be focusing on for a renovation at the exorbitant prices that baseball games charge for food. Yeah, can you even imagine what it would cost to eat at the Crab Shack at no, Camden Yards? No idea. Yeah, no idea. But just no, like that's that's not. No, if you want to do that. Go to, you know, somewhere in Fells or something like that before the game, do your crabs, and then go to the stadium right afterwards. But no, I do not want a crab shack in the stadium. All right. Fourth option here, mm-hmm. pre-game dining. Yeah. Um, so I'm interested in this is the best way to describe it. <laughs> However, and this is me being biased, um, I said I was interested in it, and then they threw me a price point. Do you know what price point they threw out per person of how much this would cost? I do not, and I'm frightened of the answer. Give, give me a number that you would think. A hundred dollars higher. Jeepers, a hundred more than a hundred dollars per person. Yeah, one hundred and fifty dollars. That is the first number they threw at you. The lowest. Yeah. That, well, I mean, so the way the surveys works is they give you an initial number and you say yes or no, and if you say yes, then they give you a higher number. And then you have to fill out that number. If you say no, it goes to a lower number for all of these categories that we're going to go through. This is them digitally sliding a number across the table. That's correct. (laughs) Oh, you don't like that? Well, how about this? Uh, So listen, um, I've been doing some research in... Uh, I'm 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 turning forty this year, so I'm 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 turning old. Is the best way to describe it. Hey, hey. Um, and I've been looking at options as it relates to my fortieth birthday. There is um an area in Club Now right behind Home Plate, mm-hmm, which you can't mm-hmm. see into it. So it's just like one of the lounge areas that has food being served to it. And I'm like, let me take a look at how much that costs, and then I would get club seats for that game. Those th- that thing cost one hundred and thirty dollars to do, and I'm like, there is no chance I'm paying one hundred and thirty dollars for ballpark food in the club section for me to walk into a club seat like there is so much better ways for me to spend my money can you imagine how much you'd have to eat and drink to make that worthwhile no, no, no chance is most of buddy. yeah so i like pregame dining strictly for the standpoint of what you just said i think setting up something like a pregame dining like you did at dempsey's and saying like hey you're going to come in here and instead of going over to pickles or instead of going over to one of the local bar areas you can swoop in there be in there an hour and a half, two hours before the game, and food is ready to go for you. I think that's a really cool idea. 
um, that I would like to see implemented, but not the way this was discussed. <laughs> All right. Fifth option. Yeah. Membership club. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is <laughs> this is another one. Um, from a monetary standpoint, I was like, this is really cool. Uh, in essence, it had like pool tables, bowling, ping pong tables. And this is like a that. year round. Yeah, year round. Membership club. I was like, that sounds pretty cool. Like, Do you think they have jackets? Oh, I guarantee you they have jackets. I was like, that's pretty cool. Then the dollar value hit. And I was just like, oh. So it was a one-time fee of $2,500 with an annual fee of $1,500. And I'm like, I'm poor. <laughs> That is more than I spend on season tickets. And I buy I buy more tickets than we do our season ticket standpoint, but good gravy. That is that's a ridiculous nuts. number. That is nuts. Yeah. Here's something. The Cleveland Guardians have a similar setup. This is from the banner. Yep. Uh called the Guardians Ballpark Pass, although it's aimed at a lower price point. For forty nine dollars a month, a month, fans can enter uh that have a standing uh standing only ticket for every home game. Uh, the Mets, meanwhile, have an exclusive outfield speakeasy club right behind right field. Well, Ray Lopez isn't going to that anymore. <laughs> um, look, I, I think a social club makes a ton of sense. I think it makes a lot of sense in terms of what they're trying to do in the South Baltimore area with like Top Golf and and some of the other bars in the area. Uh, it's got to be a lot cheaper than fifteen hundred dollars. All right, let's talk about their new seating sure. uh, recommendations here or, or options. Uh, the first of those for, for seating is something called The Nest. Okay. And this is being described as a casual social patio. Uh, standing room only. It, it kind of reminds me of like the flag court, flag court. With, with booze. Yeah, I agree. It is basically what they're trying to describe. And they, they you know, are trying to, again, emulate Cleveland's The Corner. Yep. Uh, what, what are your thoughts? This is an absolute no, no doubter for me. Like they should do this. They should do it up in left field. Done. Like it should happen. Left field upper reserve, the seats they don't sell. Left anymore. field upper reserve. And the other standpoint is like, if you're over in that left field upper reserve, coming back to the kids club area, they've got that other, it kind of, it stretches out there mm-hmm. too. Cause that's mm-hmm. where they sometimes put the moon bounce oh, in yeah, the yeah, upper yeah. deck as well. So there is a little bit more standing space already over there as it speaks. So if you rip out the seats as well, you create a large amount of square footage. So I'm all about the nest. Like the nest makes a ton of sense. Even if you think about it from a nest standpoint, if you go get an upper deck ticket, if you want to go congregate with friends or meet up with people, you head over to left field and you've got certain foods, certain beverages. And again, we've talked about this before from the upper deck. Once you get to the upper deck, it's slim pickings. So pushing everybody into a centralized area means that you should be able to offer more premium aspects and also turn food over quicker in a certain fashion to deliver on that premium experience for those individuals that are sitting in the upper deck area. All right. I've never seen this term. I'm re- I'm reading as if someone was new to yeah. the English language. Yeah. Is this loge box? Is it the loge box? <laughs> L-O-G-E. Lo- loge? 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 What is Loge? This? this is a this was a premium seating area mm-hmm. that provides comfort and convenience of a semi private seating area. Yeah. This is the first class cubicle on a flight, but at a ballpark. Somewhat. So the way this was explained is like you would have like it's almost like a mini suite area, but like you could have a half moon table, is what they said to us. Uh you could um have like recliner seats is another standpoint. Um, and there's a few other options, but like it was almost like a pa- like a little like private patio that you could sit on and, and in essence do it. So where would this be located? I would assume club. Like I would assume they would rip out some of the club sections and basically say, you know, instead of the Miller Lite flight deck or something like that. Like So like where those tables are that are shaped like home plate? Correct. Just a little swankier? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's where I think these would be. Um, they're they're we'll get to that in a few of last weeks, but I think that's where the, the loge boxes would be is the best way to describe it going forward. All right. Next we have a premium. No, we're not even discuss club. this one. This a, is ridiculous. A higher end offering. These will be uh, a variety of luxurious lounge All spaces. Right. So this obviously does not apply to us. So, <laughs> but I am going to say this much. Um, if they are thinking this, they have to be thinking along the lines of, if we can offer this, we're able to we're going to be able to get certain businesses in 
to host clientele at these premium club areas. All right. So I've been trying to shut up. I've 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 been trying to get all the way through yeah. this. But let me ask you this. Yeah. How are the sweet sales going right now? Poor. And why is that? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. One of them, one of them is that it's too expensive. Too expensive. It's too expensive yeah. for people to buy. The other aspect is there isn't a ton of businesses in the Baltimore metropolitan area that is going to basically spend to basically do suites and everything right. like that too. I am flabbergasted. Yeah. Flabbergasted by, oh, we have a product that does not provide enough value yep. and is too expensive. Yep. Let's make it even more incredibly expensive and see what happens. Like I said, this one screams to me, they think they can get businesses. And maybe Rubenstein can. Maybe with his connections, he can. But this seems like a major stretch to me. Major stretch. All right, this last one, I might be too dumb to... Oh, well, we missed the big one, which is the other one, coming back to your point. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Field-level lounges. So this is similar to when you see at Yankee Stadium or at Nat Stadium, the lower bowl. Instead of having just the lower bowl with the seats right behind home plate, like, make that just go up. Now you're going to have lounges in that area um, so that there'll be, you know, four or five seats there. Theater-style Theater-style seats. Theater-style seats. Um, and that could be, you know, right behind the dugouts, right behind the foul poles, could be right behind the home plate. Um, once again, you look at the games right now and how many times do we see the seats right behind home plate empty? Well, I don't think they're empty because people won't buy them. I think they're empty because they're not for sale. I agree with that, that they're owned by somebody else. Yeah. Um, you know, they're owned by, you know, the Sheraton and they won't give tickets to Jake English because, you know, he's no longer on the list anymore. Um, but yeah, I agree with you that someone else owns it. Um, so maybe this is an opportunity for them to really go at some of their existing customers and say, we feel like these seats deserve more of a premium on that basis. But I, I agree complete with your point is, you know, some of the money that was thrown around here in terms of like the premium club, the premium club was like, $450 $450 per per seat and you had to have like 10 plus people in there like outlandish numbers outlandish numbers I I get that baseball clubs exist to make money yeah right it is a business they are not in this because we love it I get that but but it's Baltimore, gentlemen. The well, gods will no, have no mercy. <laughs> the thing is, is that, you know, when you look at the family zone, yeah, that's about getting people into the ballpark. Sure. And that's about increasing the traffic into the ballpark, yeah. making it more accessible for people, reducing the barriers of entry. Yeah. Right. I do not begrudge the casual fan coming yep. into the ballpark. Right. I do not mind the people that are standing up taking selfies, uh, you know, in between innings because it's clear that they don't come here very often. Thank you. You're even dressed in the right color. We're we're glad to have you. But if you are making permanent changes mm-hmm. to the ballpark, yep, to basically hope that you can attract the one percenters, yep. That you better hope that makes you money because it makes it inex it makes the experience inaccessible to everybody else and and yep. with respect the everybody else should be your prime audience get them in the stadium and get them to buy yeah. 50 dollar beers or whatever you're charging sure. right now like that is for what baseball is yeah so i think it's going to be really interesting like i said they're certainly not going to implement all these changes let's let's just say that right sure. out loud um I think there's some that are absolutely a slam dunk they're going to do. I think they're easily going to come and do the family zone. I think they're easily going to come back and do the nest. And then I think they're going to pick one more of these, whether it be premium club, the field level lounges, or your last one, which is the social suite. But I do think that we're going, I mean, I just was in club. Club looks so outdated like yeah. club looks terrible like if you go through club and you see what the ravens are currently doing th- with their club section the orioles are going to have to make their more club their club level more exclusive more pomp and circumstance and you're absolutely right that is not for the common ticket holder and it's not going to impact us but at the same time 
it's part of the business. It's part of why stadiums are built in this country. And it's also part of, you know, what the team has to do too is which is make partnerships with businesses in order to further have continuous revenue coming out on that basis. So yes, you're right. It's not money that I want to be spending, but they're going to have to do it. But if they, for all the money they would have to invest in redoing club, Mm -hmm. and I, and I hear you on all those things and and I, they're going to have to, and I don't think you're wrong. Yeah. For all the money that they would have to put in to reinvent those spaces, if they made it more attractive for people to use the spaces that already exist. Like, uh, Jake, they don't want your kind in there. <laughs> it's very true. They don't want your kind in there. It's very true. They want they want companies in there. They want businesses in there. They want to have social functions. They want to be like, instead of having you know someone rent out a hotel or the Hilton, they want that group to be coming into Oriole Stadium on that basis. So, Jake, I'm sorry, but... There, you're not allowed on that on that aspect anymore. Doesn't that rec- the idea of rain delays and being like, "Hey, you're a ticket holder, you can come in the club to avoid the rain." That's a dead mission anymore. It's over. That's, it's over. Don't even think about this. Don't don't you think though that that this vision of um what the premium spaces in the ballpark can become also is dependent as a as a business model is dependent upon the club winning. No. You don't you don't think that part of the disinterest in the Orioles from the business community is the fact that it's been the laughing stock of baseball for a generation? I think part of it is because it's also John Angelos and no one really wanted to rub shoulders with it. I think if David Rubenstein or Bloomberg or a few other individuals are in essence going to be at the stadium. I think there's a possibility that certain people are going to want to be in that club area if they are walking around. Well, I hope that a little bit of baseball trickles down on the rest of us. They will while we're sitting in the upper deck or the nest um, or, you know, if we get lower bowl seats. But um, yeah, I, I, I think you're it's going to happen. But just just admit it's going to happen and just know that, you know, certain club will remain the same. But. I'm going to say 40% of club, specifically the ones between, we'll call it... The bases. Uh, the bases, exactly. Um, between the bases are going to get changed into premium club going forward in the future. So just just be ready for it. Sure. Just be ready for it. I don't know why... You don't they, like it, do you? I don't know why they didn't send me the survey, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> well, there is a link um, that anybody, if you did not get the email, there's a link. Uh, I believe Andy Koska uh, posted on on, on on X. So if you're really interested, I will say it is a very long survey. It is a very um, intense survey. It's one that really prompts a lot of questions. It's a really well done survey. And I understand what you're saying, which is like the data standpoint. They're basically figuring out levels and stuff like that. Um, from a data standpoint and a data scientist standpoint, I was very impressed by the survey. This is the best way to put it. But I did walk away with it being like, I'm poor, and I certainly, knowing knowing both of our financial situations, we're not in any bad situation from a revenue standpoint. But I looked at the revenue that was being spent there, and I'm like, that is 1% money. Well, hey, at least we get to pay uh, an increase in rates to watch it at home, too. Here, here. All right. Uh, anything else that you wanted to cover? Because, again, we have completely blown out the bases at this point no no we're uh we're they're cleaning up around us scott all right well with that um uh, it's been a while since we did fantasy boss let's go figure out who won this week on fantasy boss again how is that possible Um, so I won this week. Am I ever going to win again? Uh, the category was win probability added. Um, I chose Jordan Westberg and Corbin Burns. They both had a win probability added greater than Brian Mountcastle and Jacob Webb. Yes. So I get two points. Sure. We'll go. We'll go with two points. Okay. So what's the score now? That, that doubles you up six, three. 
Okay, so six to three. All right, well, I'll take it. Not not only did they outperform uh, my two, I believe that yours had positive integers over the two weeks that we were gone. I'm a little surprised about Jordan Westberg. I mean, he certainly has a clutch batter. Um, but I'm a little surprised about Jordan Westberg. But Corbin Burns had a really impressive... I mean, he did give up three runs in that one start. But, I mean, the other start, he was just absolutely on fire. So The thing is, though, is that those runs didn't factor into the probability of the win as much. As much is the best way to put it. But, again, um, yeah, that's why I went with the reliever. Yeah, that didn't go so well for you. It did not. No, it did not go so well. All right, so uh, I'm going to let you pick a category since you're the loser this week, right? Scotty, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I'm, I, no, no. No? I, I, I refuse. I... I'm on strike. Okay. You pick the category, Mr. I can't ever lose fantasy boss. All right. Uh, so what we're going to do uh, this week is I'm going to uh, have you pick an individual who you think is going to hit the ball the farthest this week. Fair or foul? Fair. <laughs> so I can use StatCast. <laughs> All right. This is the the Oriole who's going to hit it the furthest. Um, you know, Jorge Mateo just hit the ball the furthest that he has ever, ever, yep. ever yep. hit it. I'm trying to think of, like, who really gets a hold of him sometimes. Yep. Uh, let's see. I, um... Scotty, you're hurt. You're hurting my heart here. <laughs> I mean, it's funny because you go up and down the lineup and you could really pick any of these guys. Yeah. There's any. a lot of folks that are hitting the ball really hard and barreling the ball. Um, and even those folks that are not barreling the ball, like an Adley Rutschman, still has enough pop in his bat where he could go the longest this week. Yeah. I would not recommend Cedric Mullins. Yeah. Honestly, my my answer any other week would probably be Jordan Westberg, mm-hmm. uh, but I'm a little worried with his hand situation. I think that's a good call. I am going to go with uh, Ryan Mountcastle. All right. So you think he is going to scale the wall of Baltimore? Or, or the bullpens. Or the bullpens and uh, see what happens. Uh, I will point out, I think it's a really good call on your end to pick Ryan Mountcastle. Um where do we go next week? Uh, we were just looking at this, and now I can't remember. We uh, we go somewhere. It's a place. It's a place that we've been before. Where do we go next week? We go from Baltimore to, to Tampa? Tampa. Nope. We go to Toronto next week. <laughs> and who owns Toronto? It's Ryan Mountcastle. Yeah. He will mount that castle. So I think Ryan Mountcastle is an excellent suggestion uh and selection for this week uh but who are you gonna beat me with uh, i i don't know if i'm gonna beat you with it i think ryan madcastle was probably my pick in my head um honestly but i'm gonna go with his battery mate i'm gonna go with ryan o'hearn as my battery mate um he's been scuffling at the plate as of late um but i think you know when people scuffle they have a tendency to rebound heavy so i'm gonna go with ryan o'hearn to lay the smacketh down on the ball this week. It's really hard to go against any of these. I mean, sure, maybe not Mullins, but good Lord, all these guys can can get a hold of one. Yep. So we're looking at first base. We're going to see which first baseman uh, will hit the ball the furthest this week. Will it be Ryan Mountcastle visiting the great land to our north? Or will it be Ryan O'Hearn um, getting back on it? And we will figure out who will own it. Uh, and with that, we'll figure out who is good who is bad, and who is ugly this past week in Birdland. That's right, it's time again for the good, the bad, and the ugly. My good this week, Scott, is going to Cole Irvin. At a time when the Orioles needed starts badly, he came riding in from the bullpen, and it wasn't the longest start, but it was good. It was good. 
Cole Irvin was really impressive in the fact that we needed we needed innings and he gave us just enough. And he gave us just enough good innings. I'm hoping that Cole Irvin can, you know, remain a hot hand while we still need him, but in the short term, it was good. It was good. So it's really easy. I could go with chalk. I could say Corbin Burns. I could go with Gunnar Henderson. I'm going to go back to my individual we were talking about earlier. My good for the week is going to go to Jorge Mateo. I think Jorge has had some really clutch hits this week. I think he's played some really great defensive second baseman. Um, you know, Jorge has been playing really great all season long. I talked about the 180 uh, eight ones created plus. Again, you know, not going to walk a lot. Um, but again, he's had some really clutch hits. And there's not many times that Jorge Mateo is going to end up as your good for the week. I think we need to recognize that Jorge Mateo is playing an integral role at the bottom lineup, setting folks up like Gunnar Henderson to have RBI opportunities. And, you know, as announcers have said, it's really fun to see Cedric Mullins and Jorge Mateo both on the base pass. Speed has killed and speed has set up multiple instances of some misplaced balls across the plate. Here, here. All right, my bad is going to go to a guy we talked about earlier, mm-hmm. Thiago Vieira. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Uh, now, I'm not I'm not a math guy. Yep. Not a math guy. I think, I think, by my count, he faced five batters? Yeah. He walked four of them. Was it four or three? But yeah, it was, yeah. He uncorked a wild pitch. Yeah. He did not record an out. No outs. Gave up a triple. He has a 27 ERA. Yeah. And that was his first impression <laughs> of welcome, the new club. Welcome to Baltimore. Um, I will politely say that was bad. Yeah. Um, honestly, I thought at some point last week, this individual might have been my good at one point. Um, but unfortunately, he's back in my bad category. Uh, and that's Austin Hayes. Mm-hmm. You know, as for his first few plate appearances, when he got back, he was putting the ball in play at over 100 miles per hour. And I'm like, maybe Austin, we're going to see a return of Austin Hayes. But since his return, he's posting a 192 average, 214 on base percentage, and a 26 weighted runs created plus. Um, look, I, I, I want to see more from Hayes is the best way to put it. I want to see what happens. But man, it's getting really hard to look at Hayes and be like, I, I want to see you in the lineup every day. I, I, I can't say that right now. It's getting hard to imagine how he's going to get himself onto the starting uh, lineup in the All Star game. Yeah, it's. I mean, there are some people that are joking about like, well, Ryan McKenna's available. You know, maybe he could be your Austin Hayes replacement. I'm not ready to go to that way, but Austin Hayes, unfortunately, since returning, has been bad. I hope he figures it out and gets it together. My ugly feels ugly. Yeah. And that means that I'm going to have to talk about Colton Kowser. Yeah. He's had a rough, rough He's time. Had a rough lately. offensive performance lately. Uh, a three weighted runs created plus. Yeah. He's striking out a third of the time. He's got just a 163 Woba. Uh, he's going, he's going through some things right now. He's, he is, um, he is on the bus to struggle. And, uh, hey, I, I, you know, I need to see him work out of it. Uh, but right now, whew, ugly. I feel Offensively. Like, I feel like he's turning the corner. Like, that's what I will say is, like, I look at it, and I look at him take walks. Um, I, I look at what he's doing, and I think he's suffering through what all rookies suffer through, which is you have, you know, a really good hot start. You know, Major League Baseball pitching is going to correct and adjust. And now it is the opportunity for Colton Kowser to readjust once again and go into the positive once again. So I, I'm i bullish on Colton Kowser on this one. I understand that he's had, um, you know, honestly, you know, a bad few weeks. I wouldn't even call it this past week was bad. He's had a bad few weeks at this point. But I think he's going to get it together. Um, and I would still say, you know, looking at everything, looking at his bats, looking at his plate appearances, I still think I would take Colton Kowser over Cedric Mullins right now at the plate. Um, my ugly is going to go to another all-star, um, that we have from last year and it's Yenny or Cano. Oof. I don't feel good about Yenny or Cano. So Yenny or Cano currently on the season for relief pitchers has the highest expected weighted on base average, um, 
for any Baltimore relief pitcher at this given moment. It just doesn't seem like he has it. He has a lot of balls that he's leaving up. They're launching him into the gaps or putting home runs on them. He's not that kind of ground ball pitcher that we have seen in the past. So if he can't be that ground ball pitcher, what is he? Like, what is he good for? Yes, he gets whiffs and he's going to get case per nine and stuff like that. But without that ground ball induction standpoint, I don't know. Like, I look at Yenier Cano and I'm like, you're kind of ugly right now. Like, I don't really trust Yenier Cano in 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 high leverage situations right now. Um, I much more trust you know Craig Kimbrell at this given point. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, you look at his ground ball rates for the season, and they're actually higher this season than they are last year. It just seems like he's elevating more balls. Um, mm-hmm. And if you look at his home runs per nine this season, it's at one point five zero versus last year being zero point five zero. So it doesn't look like his ground ball rate is bad per se, but it looks like from a fly ball standpoint, um, the fly balls that he's putting in play and line drives are really hard hit. So I think you are correct in all things, but let me tell you why I'm going to choose not to care. Okay. You're going to ignore everything. All that. I would like to direct your attention to the emotional capital that I expended on deciding how I felt about CNL Perez. Mm -hmm. Did I trust him? Did I not trust him? Did I want him on the team? Did I want him tied to a railroad track? I went back. I went forth. I was this way. I was that way. Scott, I can't live like that anymore. Just going to let it ride. Just going to let it ride. You know what? You near Cano, you can be ugly this week. Hopefully you get it together next week. I hope so too. I hope he gets it together and I hope he figures it out by the time September and October rolls around. But right now, I just don't really have a high confidence in the Yannir Cano at this moment. I think what you're saying is we're staring in and he's on notice. Absolutely. All right. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and finish this up. We're going to go ahead and blow the save. And uh, Jake, I'll let you take it away. All right, Scotty, as I look at the calendar, you know, we just checked out the schedule. Uh, But as I look at the calendar, I'm reminded that Pride Month starts in two days. Oh, yeah. that's Pride Month is June, right? That's right. Yeah. And the Orioles, along with many other businesses throughout this great country of ours, the Orioles have decided that it is a better business investment to align itself with messages of inclusion, tolerance, and love than it is, well, to be seen as regressive or intolerant. And that will bring a certain subset of fans out of the woodwork to violently complain about it and to make you feel bad, or at least try. And so this is my annual reminder of two things. The first is that those very loud people that are going to be all over your social media feed do not have a problem with Faith Night or Armed Services Day. And the second is that these fans do an excellent job of showing you exactly how to use the mute and block buttons on all of your social media feeds. Orioles fans, enjoy the great baseball. The story is the baseball that brings us together and ignore the jerks. And that, that is our show. Remember, you can find this in our entire catalog of indispensable episodes at birdseyeviewbaltimore.com. Bird's Eye View is available for download wherever it is you get your podcast. Um, subscribe to us on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and now on YouTube Music. That's been fixed. Uh, there was an issue with it. Um, I don't think anyone out there is really using YouTube Music, but if you are, let me know on a direct message because uh, I'd like to talk to you and be asking you the question why you're doing so. Um, please remember to rate and review the show. We appreciate the feedback, and it encourages other people to listen for the first time. Come and get social with us. You can email us at contact at birdseyeviewbaltimore.com. You can find us all over social media. We're on Blue Sky. We're on Threads. We have an Instagram account. We're on Facebook. We have Snapchat. We're on the ticks and the talks while it is still legal. And you can find us on a site that used to be called Twitter, where we do a thing that used to be called tweeting, at birdseyeviewbal. And with that, 
Baltimore and beyond, I will bid you all a fond adieu, adieu. Good night, Baltimore. Be safe out there. And let's go O's. Enjoy the baseball one percenters. Start saving that money for the rest of us. But yeah, looking forward to it. Looking forward to the changes and looking forward to seeing what the Orioles do to get more people in the stadium. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.